Where? Down. Okay. Okay. LC. Are we doing LCE? Go for it. Okay, so this was the big day. Sunday morning before visitors arrived, we decided it was time to boot up the DMS-10 for the first time. Colin had spent weeks wiring it up, making sure that everything was correct. And this is the first time any of us have wired this type of switch before, so it was a real big learning experience. And we wanted to be methodical and make sure that we got everything right. Earlier that week, Colin had finally wired up 48 volts to the switch from the battery board upstairs and then put green tape over the circuit breakers as a sign to not mess with them. The last thing to do was to run the serial cable for the local TTY. We're using a VT420 here because that was what the machine would have originally shipped with. And you just know that serial terminals never work the first time. So we didn't really have high hopes that we'd get any output at all. And on to powering up the switch. Uh, we are using the cold start procedure as defined in the Nortel practices. So we have some idea of what we're doing here. Um, Colin begins by turning on all of the main breakers and you can hear the fan spinning up as the current starts flowing. Turn on all circuit breakers proceeding from left to right direction. Okay. Fans. Down. Okay. Go for it. Yeah, I expect nothing to happen here. Oh no. Okay. So they're they're on the B bus. These guys. Okay, that means there's no shorts. So may I, is the next yeah. step, do that? Yes. Okay. After that, it's time to turn on the secondary breakers at each of the common equipment frames. These contain the CPU and network cards, and the left bay contains the GR303 trunk circuits. Okay. Everything is fail. <laughs> Wait. Everything is fail. Yeah. yeah. Try it again. No. Did not like it. Okay. Uh, now that all the breakers are on, the DMS-10 can start to boot. This is a really lengthy process. It was only meant to be performed once, and they didn't exactly optimize for a fast boot-up sequence. So there's a lot of waiting going on here that I am cutting out of this video. A few minutes later. 20 amps. Drawing 20.81 amps. Yeah, nothing's on yet, but... Okay. <laughs> I mean, the well, fans are on. The fans are on. There. We'll see what it draws when it's really good. It's nothing there. So um, far, so good. So all the enables on except for the two cores. So we're going to take everything we're set. We're going to do it in the elevator. Except... So. Yep. Okay. 
the synchronous clock and the SCSI bus? Uh, yes, both those ones. I'll do the same up here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Operate, enable, uh, step 30 is operate, enable 3T70. So, here we go. On just the lower core, right? Core zero. It booting. 201. 201 is exactly what we wanted. Uh, <laughs> it's like, that's the program counter, right? I don't know. <laughs> it's just real One slow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, after 201 is displayed, perform the following. It's reading from the disk. And then it says, do it on this one. Oh, yeah, do it. Can I push this button? Or you already did? I did it. Okay, but it's going to, core, core zero is going to syslog in and out. Okay. So we're going to get a bunch of codes here. Mm -hmm. And it could last 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. So it's 1030. <laughs> Say hi, everybody. Hello. It's everybody. We're all very excited. We're just speechless. We're so excited. Does anybody actually have any lines up to this yet? No, no lines. I looked up what message 383 means, and it just says that teletype number 3 is disabled. <laughs> <laughs> oh heavens. Oh, no. And now finally we get something on the terminal. This is really exciting because we weren't sure that we'd see any output at all and maybe we'd be stuck in serial debugging hell. Um, also this means the CPU is healthy and happy, at least enough to send us messages. Hey, hey sis. <gasps> telephone switches, the DMS-10 boots up into a complete alarm state. This is a normal telephony practice that goes back quite a while. Everything is an alarm until it's proven to be good, functional, and in service. We expected this, so we weren't surprised to see all of the lights on the front of the switch. That just means that the machine is doing what it's supposed to do. Normally, telco alarms come in two basic flavors major and minor. Major alarms indicate that there's a problem that could impact service from the customer's perspective. It may not impact all customers or even most customers, but theoretically, something is not working and it really should get fixed soon. Minor alarms are used for less important failures. Maybe something is operating a little bit out of spec or a service is diminished in some way that's not going to impact customer perspectives in a real immediate way. What was funny was the catastrophic alarm indication on the front panel. As someone who works with electromechanical switches, I'm used to major and minor alarms, but I'd never seen a real catastrophic alarm before. So that made us all chuckle a little bit. 
Anyway, most of these alarms exist because our DMS-10 is not in the same configuration that it was in AdTrans Lab. So it's missing connections to hardware that it expects to have, and it's missing connections to its remote sites that it would normally be communicating with. We'll deal with all of this eventually, but for now, we just want to get it into a state where it's stable enough to be left alone without adult supervision. The day they turn the switch off, um, so really should not have that. What kind of terminal is this? It's a DEC VT420. Um, so that's that's what these were shipped with in the late 90s. Uh, this is a this was shipped in 2001. Um, so this is the right terminal for it. Um, in the very early 70s, it would have all been real teletypes, yeah. physical manual uh, teletypes. So that was that was our main like work today was just getting the t uh, the terminal to talk to the CPU to make sure that, that communication is is working correctly. Yeah, there's a there's a RS232 that goes to that. And it should also it also has Ethernet, uh, but we have not gone anywhere near that yet. Um, we're, they did not tell us that anything was was completely busted, so they shut it off like several years before um, we were there, before we went to pick it up. Um, and at that time, it was fine as far as they knew. Um, some of the ringing generators were broken, and they knew that and told us about it. But other, everything else, they just thought it was okay. What? Well, like that that whole little bit thing. So, so we have. Uh, the sort of CPU and network zero running. That's the one that we booted by default. Um, and it came up and started to do all of its diagnostics and tests. Um, and I'm still kind of mad, um, but it's at least in a state that we can work with it. Um, CPU and network one is offline and not ready to take over if a switch needed to happen. Um, so we need to do some manual um, manual commands to tell it to do the diagnostics to finish booting CPU 1 in order to have them both sort of ready to go. We're in what's called one bus mode where you only have a single layer of redundancy, you don't have the backup uh, network running, and so we need to get out of one bus mode. There's a, there's a warning light here saying that we're in one bus mode that's pretty bad. Um, we currently have catastrophic major and minor alarms all present, um, that's also pretty bad. Um, we'd at least like to get out of catastrophic mode. Um, I don't know how to get out of catastrophic alarm <laughs> mode yet, so that's we're going to have to figure that out still. <laughs> so what's next? Well, since this video is coming out a couple weeks after the actual power on event, we've made significant progress in squashing many of the alarms. And we've gained a better understanding of the system's architecture and the command language that's used to interact with the switch. There are still several things in alarm, but we have a pretty good idea of how to resolve those. For one thing, we need to disable or remove all of the remote sites that are programmed into this thing, but we want to actually document the existing configuration before we do that. Remote sites are concentrations of subscribers that are connected to some remote module far away. That module then homes on this switch which provides the actual phone service. Given that this machine originated in an area in Texas with a relatively small and spread out population, it makes sense that there were many remote sites configured. Another thing we need to do is set up the nightly backup routine to a new magneto optical disc. This machine came to us with the very same disc that was in the drive when the thing was brand new in the year 2000. We'd like to preserve that disk and use a new one for our nightly backups. We actually got some too, but then realized that they were the wrong size. These are 230 megs and the, DM, the DMS actually wants a 540 meg disk. Um, and we've priced some of those out and they are like unreasonably expensive on eBay. So maybe some will come up at a reasonable price. Um, Colin's actually away this week for his day job, uh, so Matt and I will end up doing some more work on it in the next few days, 
and I'm proud to say we're making pretty good pace here, and we have a path forward, uh, you know, projected where we want to be, and we see how we can get there. So, uh, nothing but good things for this switch, and uh, I'm sure you'll get an update video pretty soon with where we're at. So, remember to like and subscribe, and thanks a lot. See you next time. So, oddly enough, the procedure that we found all of this in was the like, so you're doing maintenance on the power converters. <laughs> like, <laughs> the, the procedures for like bringing it up from the oops, the phone company lost power. The procedures for that are like apply power. Did it come up? Cool. Did it not? Panic. <laughs> well, like the, the, you did, you did work on this. Is like, oh, this is how to get it out of headless mode. But the, the success of the success state at the end of going from cold and dark to like back to serving customers is like just you barely got dial tone. Okay, you're probably gonna go like collapse for a day and recover, um, and then come back and go fix all the CPU details. Um, so. They didn't even cover the like CPU setup process because you can switch calls without doing all this. Really, you can? Yeah, right. Just barely. Just barely, right? So you come up in a situation where you have no redundancy of anything, but you've you've made it to providing dial tone to customers. Yeah. So that is that is like good enough compared to being cold and dark. Right.